I'd have to say, secondly, another misconception is I think puzzles are a big part of its appeal and leaving out some of these symbols and things just were begging people to investigate it further and invites engagement and experimentation. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. Today, we are so excited to talk about the Grimorium Verum with scholar and author Joseph H. Peterson. So what is the Grimoireum Verum, also known as the True Grimoire? Why is it considered one of the most notorious handbooks of black magic dealing openly with spirits of darkness? Well, Joseph H. Peterson is the best person to ask. Joe has recently released his second edition of his Grimoireum Verum. It incorporates 15 years of additional research, which has helped clear up many problems with the primary text and also helped expand the circumference of our understanding with this grimoire. Joe really needs no introduction for those interested in grimoires and Solomonic magical manuscripts and translations. In addition to being the proprietor of esotericarchives.com, an incredibly generous resource of grimoires, analysis, spirit names, and more, Joseph Peterson is, as another great scholar David Rankin says, quote, the diamond standard for grimoire scholarship. Joe's vital publications of the Lamegaton, the Arbitel, the Sworn Book of Honorius, the Elucidation of Necromancy, examining the Proto-Heptameron texts, and dozens of other works and insights makes Joe's work vital, permanent, and one of the reasons that we find ourselves in this grimoire renaissance, quote unquote, in the last 20 years or so. I want to thank each and every Glitch Bottle patron and supporter of the podcast for your excellent questions for Joe on the Grimoireum Verum, which we're getting into. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, let's welcome back Joseph H. Peterson. Joseph H. Peterson. Thank you so, so much for taking some time and returning on the Glitch Bottle podcast today. Thanks, Alex. It's an honor to be here. Joe, the honor and uh, pleasure is mine. And I know it is for thousands of other listeners to hear your latest research. And another scholar and author, the great David Rankin said about your updated edition when he was sharing it on social media, said, quote, I'm sharing this because Joseph H. Peterson is the diamond standard for grimoire scholarship, and all his books are essential reading, unquote. And since we all agree with David, I think the best first question for you, Joe, is what made you decide that right now is the best time to share and publish your updated second edition? Well, it's always a dilemma for authors when to produce something, because there's always seems to be something else to update. And to be honest, this whole project started back in the 1970s. One of the very first texts that I was interested in researching and spent some time at the British Library, British Museum at that point to try to unravel some of the puzzles of it. But things keep cropping up since then. And since I published it, I was able to track down, especially in the last five years, the uh, connection with the uh, Secrets of Solomon text, which saw widespread distribution in the 1600s in Europe, and new findings kept coming up. And so I'm just trying to incorporate things. But a couple of things came up very recently that prompted me to finally publish it where I was at. The first of which was I had decided to make my full transcripts of Grimorium Verum and the Grimorium of Pope Anurius available on my website. Previously, it was only on my CD, which I no longer have available. So people kept asking for it, and I decided to put those out there. And looking at them, I saw that there were some things that I need, wanted to update and improve the graphics and things like that. And so that was one thing that kind of 
kicked me into gear on producing this. The other thing is that, that people kept asking about if there was a new edition forthcoming because of the new findings related to the Secrets of Solomon text, which which was one of the direct ancestors to the Grimorium Verum. Can you share to that point, Joe, what is the historical context of the Grimoireum Verum? You know, when was it first composed? And in the text itself, when does the author allege that the text was composed? Anything you can share? The earliest version we have is the Olibeck edition, which has 1517 printed on there as the date of publication. But based on critical textual analysis, it's probably 1817, which is what uh, Emil Weller in his book on analyzing the uh, fictitious dates and places on a wide variety of books. And he was really the one of the experts on doing this, but also based on the Secrets of Solomon, which was circa 1600. But of course, all of these texts never seem to be solidified until they're printed and the manuscripts show that it was adapted and changed up slightly by each successive collector or manuscript copier. Elements are found centuries earlier, including the Key of Solomon, Clavicula Solomonis, which is probably mid-1400s. And some of the spells contained, like the invisibility spell, can be tracked back centuries earlier than that even. Someone out there might be saying, here I'm reading about the Grimoire Verum for the first time and finding out that it's one of the few grimoires that openly deals with spirits of darkness. Can you elaborate a little bit on openly dealing with those spirits? Yeah, I just mean that it conjures directly Lucifer, Beelzebub, and Astaroth, which are the most notorious of the infernal hierarchy. Those three were censored out of Wire's edition of the Offices of Spirits, which eventually became incorporated into the Goetia of the, the Magetan and earlier Offices of Spirits have those, such as the, the ones that's in, included in the Book of Oberon or the Folger Manuscript of Magic. Wire 2, I believe, mentions that he left out those names, or it's apparently missing names in his appendix, because he wanted to render the work unusable and said, listen, people should not mess around with that, but that does include omitting LBS, Lucifer, Beelzebub, and Satan. Is that about right? Or Yes, exactly. What are some of these newly identified manuscript and print sources that you found? And and how did you first find these? Because I know that you will go to you know great scholarly lengths to find manuscripts. Yeah, it's a lot of fun finding new material, obviously, for me. The most important one was the Welcome 983 manuscript. And that was actually Adam McLean had a document on his website, who I've been you know, friends with and following for quite a while. But he had a, a summary of some of the Solomonic manuscripts and went through that that one in particular, it seemed to have a connection to the Grimorium Verum. So we got access to the photos of that. And indeed, it seems to be a immediate direct ancestor of the Grimorium Verum, which has a lot of the figures that were left out of the Alabac edition. Also, the Secrets of Solomon manuscripts, finding those was a big thing. The other thing is I've found several additional early editions of the Grimoire of Pope Anurius. Those are now accessible due to massive worldwide digitization efforts. Also continued searches. Uh, sometimes I'll search the same websites over and over and over and new things pop up. For example, the British Library website has recently digitize a bunch of John D manuscripts and and made them available out there. Other texts are pointed out to me by friends on Facebook or other sources, some on academia.edu by people that I follow there. It's just a, a lot of uh, activity that is a little bit overwhelming just because of the mass of material. Joe, to that point, you mentioned just now and a little bit earlier about the importance of the grimoire of Pope Honorius. Can you share with us a little bit, for the listeners who might not be too familiar, 
what is the grimoire of Pope Honorius and and how did your research into the grimoire help correct many of specifically the missing figures in certain parts of the grimoire verum? Yeah, well, using critical textual analysis, I was able to establish that the Grimorium Verum drew on the Grimoire of Pope Honorius for the secrets section. So it has uh, all the practical section and then it appended a bunch of secrets. And those obviously or evidently came from the uh, Pope Honorius text. Unfortunately, the again, Alabek leaves out the referenced figures, even though the text says, you know, see the following plate with figure two or see figure three. Unfortunately, many of the grimoire of Pope Honorius texts were missing some of the plates and other plates were displaced. So it's very difficult to match them all up. In fact, it was impossible to match them all up. Some of them were completely missing from the additions that I had already collected, which were several, I had collected several uh, different ex- exemplars of the Grimoire and Pope Honorius. I er- erroneously thought that there weren't that many editions and, and the ones would be similar to these, but I proved to be incorrect with that, that there was a w- wide number of printings of this thing. It was just amazing to me. And they're all slightly different. And some of them have the, the missing plates and some of them don't. And some of them have the plate in the in a position where it says the following plate when it was really the preceding plate. Using the critical analysis, you can match them up um, very accurately if you reconstruct the superior versions of these. So establishing the genealogy was a big thing there, but it was a little like the ninth gate trying to compare each copy and find which one was the superior one. Ah, yes, the Delo Melanican, the Invocation of Darkness and the Nine Gates to the Kingdom of Shadows. That is, I'm saving myself from going down a rabbit hole with you because I would love your <laughs> would, would love your thoughts on that. And the Club Dumas, the book that's based on, as you mentioned, you were just, you know, shocked, surprised to see all of these different publications out there and then comparing them. Is that kind of an outlier as a scholar where when you're looking at a specific text, to find that many different sources from which you can compile? Or does that usually happen in your research? Or how does that usually work? Like the lapidary that Vajra was talking about, there are certain texts that there's different versions of and translations of. But in this case, the Grimoire of Poponarius editions were so similar that you really had to look at the fonts and the details of the drawings and things like that to tell the difference of them. I wouldn't expect them completely different publishers to be resetting the text over and over and over like that. To that point, Joe, we have a question for you from podcast supporter Richard Irving, who is saying, quote, Hello, Joe. I absolutely loved your Secrets of Solomon book from a few years back. You mentioned that the Secrets of Solomon text is one of the ancestors of the Grimoire Verum. Can you share about why this is the case and if new research in the last few years added more details that are not covered in your secrets book? Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. I appreciate the support. I'm actually very proud of the Secrets of Solomon book. I think its backstory alone is fascinating because it was obviously in use by practicing witches in in that era who happened to get reported to the Inquisition and brought before trial, and lots of their neighbors and stuff were brought in to testify about what they saw through the windows of their uh, working area. So, But it does indeed contain an older and more comprehensive text in Latin, I do give some examples of that, like the description of Lucifer in the two are similar, but much simplified in the uh, Grimorium Verum from what we can see in the um, Secrets of Solomon text. So passages in the Grimorium Verum, which are confusing in the French, make a lot more sense, especially to me in the older Latin text. So having said that, there's still some puzzles, especially the Grimorium Verum has some extra spirits that are not in the Secrets of Solomon, such as Skirlin and also extra symbols around the magic circle 
that don't appear in those. So it's not exactly clear to me where all that came from. And I guess uh, to sum up, there's a lot more to be discovered there. As you mentioned, Joe, grimoires such as the famous Lamegaton's Goetia, which I believe you published in 2001 and shared that, do not include Lucifer, Beelzebub, and, and Satan, you know, or known as LBS, this kind of infernal triumvirate. And they're considered to be part of the missing hierarchy used in ritual ceremonies of Solomonic magic. Yet the Grimoirum Verum, as you've indicated, it includes conjurations too, you know, Beelzebub and Lucifer. Are these conjurations just for someone who hasn't picked up an addition yet? Are they standalone operations or are they part of a broader ritual? In my uh, view, they're part of the overall operation of Grimorium Verum to ensure the cooperation of the dependent or lesser spirits. I know Skrillin, for example, who you've mentioned. I know, obviously, Jake Stratton Kent, may he rest in peace, uh, and many practitioners of the true grimoire talk about Skrillin a lot. Can you share a little bit about the broad strokes about this spirit and just the importance of the spirit to the grimoire verum? Yeah, it's interesting that it doesn't appear in the Secrets of Solomon other than his sigil does, and it matches up directly, but they don't include his name directly in there. But I do reference that in the new edition, and I actually include two different variants of the symbol, as well as what the equivalent is in the Secrets of Solomon. And one of the things that's in the Secrets of Solomon that kind of opens one of the first sections of your book is for the operator to draw a specific symbol. And there's room in there for them to put their initials, for example, in, in the Secrets of Solomon. Does that also carry over to the Grimoireum Verum, or can you share about anything else that, as, as you mentioned, maybe is in the secrets and not in the Grimoireum Verum? Or that specifically is uh, what is the equivalent of the Skirlin symbol, and he seems to be in both texts act as a as a secretary or intermediary to the other spirits, preparing that with your initials on it as a seen as an endorsement, a badge that you're in their camp or have their cooperation. Is that same bridge that we that you share about the secrets of Solomon between the folk tradition and the more learned tradition, is that bridge also in the Grimoireum Verum? Or can you just talk about that relationship between folk magic and the more learned, quote unquote, tradition? Yeah, I think in the case of both, this is one of the surprises, I, I guess, that came up for me is that they do both seem to have been actively practiced. And it wasn't just a compilation done by some publisher to sell copy. They were actually put into use. And part of that is just how much they've been adapted, the different variants, but also the eyewitness reports and the fact that we have obvious examples of use and abuse of the manuscripts by the practitioners. So... Listeners, definitely please check out the podcast and video descriptions to get your own copy of Joe's second edition of the Grimoireum Verum, as well as a link to the invaluable esotericarchives.com because it's it's just such a wonderful resource. And uh, Joe, too, you were chatting a, a little bit about surprises when you were researching this. And I know that you've you've had many different adventures and journeys researching different manuscripts. In addition to what you just shared, what were some of the other things that surprised you about this 15-year period of research that you did into the Grimoireum Verum? Anything that, that was unexpected or stood out to you? One thing was the extent to which the Secrets of Solomon was practiced, as we just talked about, that it was not just some publisher's invention to sell books or some literary exercise which could easily be assumed uh, just reading it casually. Another surprise, as we talked about earlier, too, was the large number of Grimor Popenarius editions and how messed up the drawings were on those, uh, which made it virtually impossible to, to fill in the blanks of the Grimorium Verum, which was dependent on it. So, Joe, too, we have a listener question for you um, from Mitch. And Mitch is asking and saying, Hi, Alex. Good to hear Joseph is back on. I totally agree, Mitch. And Mitch says, 
he's a really interesting guy. In episode 14 and episode 32 of Glitch Bottle, Joe shared some insights into Zoroastrianism. And in episode 32, Joe explained that Zoroastrianism has a dualistic cosmology. It strives to repel evil spirits and attract and please the good ones. And so Mitch is saying, seeing as the Grimoire Verum is aimed at attracting evil spirits, I'm wondering if it nevertheless does fit into the Zoroastrianistic worldview or whether other considerations were at play. Kind regards, Mitch. Well, thanks to the question, Mitch. I'll have to say that Zoroastrianism recognizes the evil spirits, but as such views them as much more dangerous than the Solomonic tradition, which tends to view them, a lot of them at least, as as being fairly stupid creatures that can be coerced fairly easily. As a Zoroastrian, I I don't try to attract them or work with them, but stick just stick with the beneficent spirits. And Joe, I, I know you've mentioned this as well, your practicing of Zoroastrianism. And listeners, if you are looking for more information, uh, Joe also has Avesta.org, which contains just wonderful Zoroastrian texts and, and archives and excellent information. Just broadly speaking, Joe, can you share what are one or two misconceptions that people might hold about the Grimoireum Verum? Are, are there one or two things that when people pick up a copy of your second edition and they start going through the book, is there anything you'd like them to keep in mind going through this text? Well, that's a great question, Alex. I appreciate that. One thing is that the Italian editions follow Blokel, Simon Blokel, who was not a an occultist, but a chapbook publisher. And his editions clearly tried to hide the defects rather than fix them, such as the knife symbols, substituting the character Bichard for the uh, original knife symbols, deleting references to figures that the original edition that he was making a version of uh, included. And it was it's real obvious when you compare them how much changes he made to to try to improve the saleability of his book, but not the actual usability of it. So these kinds of what I might call uninformed flights of fancy have been propagated widely to all of the Italian editions, Musi and Bestetti, and have been picked up by uh, occultists and others who were trying to produce some type of an account of the Grimorian Barum, such as Waite and Shah, who just assumed based on a quick look at it that the Italian editions were better informed rather than informed by Blokel's inventions. I'd have to say, uh, secondly, another misconception is I think puzzles are a big part of its appeal and leaving out some of these symbols and things just were begging people to investigate it further and invites engagement and, and experimentation. Between the Secrets of Solomon and the Grimoire and Verum, in the Secrets book, as you mentioned, even right on the on the title, that when it comes to the Venetian Inquisition and people being brought up on charges you know, for using books like the Secrets of Solomon, do we see the Grimoireum Verum appearing in the witch trial records or any other further prosecutory aspects in, in Europe or anything comparative to uh, the Secrets of Solomon? I haven't seen anything specific to that text. I might have missed something, obviously. But relative to the Secrets of Solomon, one thing that surprised me about that whole text and the court records is the light sentences that all of the participants got. The impression modern people, I think, have of these witch trials is that it was someone accused a neighbor of witchcraft and they almost inevitably get burned at the stake or hung. And it just was not the case. In the case of this, most of them just got some prison time or just some time in the pillory, a couple hours in the pillory, and they were home. So that was something that surprised me about that. I'm thinking of Dan Harms, who was on the podcast recently talking about witch bottles. And one of the things he shared was the light sentence that people got, you know, whether it was in the New World or even some trials over in Europe. But when it come when it came to punishment for specifically using a witch bottle, it was not exactly as severe as maybe some people might have expected. So 
Does that seem to be, I guess, a common trend where perhaps sometimes right in the middle of the Inquisition and you know the Spanish Inquisition, perhaps in the 16th century, it might be pretty severe. But overall, does it seem to kind of vary from place to place? Yeah, there were clearly some authorities that were more threatened by this activity, but a common theme going all the way back to ancient times seems to be when it does threaten the authority directly. For instance, an astrological forecast that says the the current ruler is, is going to die or is going to be supplanted by this newly identified person, that's a direct threat to them because it encourages support for the other party. And those are the kinds of things that get you into big trouble with the court and likely to get executed. Whereas if it's not a direct threat to, to them, they'll look aside, ensconce to, to a large degree. One of the things, Joe, that you mentioned as well several times and something Dr. Sophie Page mentioned when she was on the podcast talking about her book, Magic in the Cloister, in the 13th and 12th centuries about a group of monks in the UK who were at a monastery. One of the things that you mentioned is there seems to be this assumption people have that in all of Europe, all of the church, specifically ecclesiastical authorities were against magic. But something that you pointed out and Dr. Sophie Page did that even when it came to church officials, it definitely varied from region to region, a diocese, a country. Can you share a little bit more about that from the church perspective too? Yeah, there were certain notorious figures within the church that were obsessed with anything they considered non-orthodox and labeled it all as being deceptions of the devil. And I think they got a lot more press than they deserve, but there was clearly people high up in the church as well as up in the aristocracy and such that were involved to some extent with these practices. So, Joe, we have a listener question for you from Wilma M. And Wilma is asking and saying, Joseph H. Peterson, the man, the myth, the legend. So excited he's returned to Glitch Bottle. My question is this. We are hearing all the time about how we are in a grimoire renaissance of the new translations and other updates. As one of the most well-known and key scholars who's responsible for this renaissance, your 2001 publication of The Lesser Key of Solomon haunts me to this day in the best way. Wilma says, what is your take, Joe, on the so-called renaissance? Are we just scratching the surface with new material? Is there much more that we don't know? Thank you so much, Joe. I love your work. Well, thank you for your support, Wilma, and for the question. Um, as you kind of imply, we really are just scratching the surface. The number of texts is pretty much overwhelming for any one researcher. So collaboration and specialization is becoming more and more important. For example, a big part of unraveling these is the paleography and the paleography of, for instance, the Swiss manuscripts is a specialty of Albert de Roles, one of the top scholars in the world on this. And we just couldn't piece things together without the, the kind of pioneering work on paleography with him. Others have specialties in various languages. For instance, there's a lot of uh, Nordic materials, which I have not have the expertise to try to mine. And as I said, I'm pretty much overwhelmed with just the stuff that I have a fairly solid grasp on the languages for. So it does really underscore the importance of collaborating with others who have these other additional skills. It's such a great point, Joe. And as a follow-up to the above question on grimoire publications, you shared earlier in the year um, on social media that, quote, manuscript digitation efforts in Ukraine, including thousands of manuscripts in church, Slavonic, and Latin, unquote, are being digitized. Can you share a little bit more about this effort and other efforts and this avalanche of manuscripts being digitized? For example, is the Vatican Library still digitizing a lot of manuscripts and sharing them online? Or what are the big places that stick out to you? Well, thanks. Posting about the Ukraine digitization effort was specifically about the HMML or the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library. They're a 
headquartered here in my backyard at St. John's University in Minnesota and for many decades have been a key resource for scholars in medieval manuscripts. For over 55 years, they've been photographing libraries from European monasteries and churches. And most of those were originally in microfilm. And you have to actually go there to St. John's to view some of the works. A lot of them, of course, are the uh, majority are going to be religious literature from the, from the monasteries, but a lot of other uh, important works relative to the esoteric texts. Uh, for instance, St. John's has a huge collection, important collection of uh, Trithemius material. It's also where I found the German edition of the six and seven books of Moses, which was the basis for my uh, edition of that te particular text. Relating to the Vatican, they started digitizing their entire collection in 2010. So they've been at it for quite a while, but they have over 80,000 manuscripts. So it it does take some time. The Welcome Library has been digitizing stuff and important versions of the uh, Green Room Opener is in their collection was photographed and uh, the photographs are really pretty poor. Um, they weren't centered, so you're missing margins on a lot of them, but they keep adding text and have generally been doing a very good job. The ASV, the Archive of the Venetian Inquisition, has a big digitization project in progress, as well as the Rittman Library keeps adding uh, text to theirs. Uh, I mentioned the British Library as well, adding the uh, D material and other esoteric texts from their collection. So, yeah, that's a huge thing worldwide. Does it also come down to reaching out specifically to librarians ac across multiple countries for a specific text? For example, I'm thinking of the Vatian Library, uh, VSG 334, one of the elucidarium or elucidations of necromancy that you have in your wonderful book that you published a couple of years back. I remember you reaching out to the librarian there, and is that how sometimes they can find things and then send photographs? Oh, yeah. It's becoming less and less common because so much material is being automatically digitized. But I used to spend the majority of my time reaching out to librarians and archivists to arrange photographs. And in some cases, they didn't have any facilities for photographing things and suggested that you know, that I hire a grad student to do the photographs for me or just come there myself, and which I ended up doing in a large number of cases. For instance, the St. John's Six and Seven Books of Moses, I went there and physically uh, photographed it myself. There's other examples of that. The Rabbi Solomon text, the clavis of Rabbi Solomon text from Utah, that was another one that I actually traveled to their library and had to photograph myself. A lot of times I've been able to, and, and others are able to, just contact them and arrange for photography. And also, listeners will find this familiar, Joe, if they listen to the um, Secrets of Solomon podcast you did. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm doing this from memory. But to that very point, when it comes to locating manuscripts, when you think of you know the modern founder of Wicca, Gerald Garner... And his library and having a specific manuscript, didn't you also drive out for that with a camera and took pictures of that? Yeah, I brought my whole photography set up specifically for scanning books in a safe way that, that wouldn't press it on the glass. And they graciously allowed me to set it up on their dining room table and took over the whole thing and, and was able to photograph it in a day and a half and showed me some of the other titles in the uh, Gerald Gardner collection. But that was, a, that was a lot of fun. I got to meet a lot of fascinating people there, including the current owners. You were just sharing a little bit ago about collaboration with scholars and researchers. And David Rankin, for example, you know, says that you are the diamond standard for grimoire scholarship. And another scholar who is just on the Glitch Bottle podcast, Vajra Reagan, in a recent episode, praised your scholarship and also your ability to collaborate and share your feedback and your thoughts and your insights into another person's research. In this case, Vajra Reagan researching a medieval lapidary text. Why is it so important, Joe, to your point, for 
scholars, especially in today's day and age, to collaborate on projects? Well, again, there's so much material and so much specific technical knowledge, such as knowledge of various flavors of astrology from the period. At the simplest level, I've kind of harped on this on a number of times and places, a comparison of transcriptions by two separate individuals is considerably more accurate than one person proofreading his own transcription multiple times. I've proven this to my own satisfaction uh, every time I go out there and find a typo in a title that I've uh, reviewed multiple times. Yeah, getting additional set of eyes on it, it just is uh, amazing improvements that you can get from that. When it comes to, Joe, your own projects, I, I know this goes without saying you are always working on something. You're always thinking about something. When I check pages on esotericarchives.com, I can see when they're last updated. And then that sends me down a rabbit hole of drinking too much coffee and, and looking for the latest update in, in the uh, page that you made. But can you share with us about or maybe give us some hints about what projects are you working on? What what research or just what what esoteric topics are you thinking about nowadays? I'm currently working on a translation of the Latin versions of the Almadel, uh, which to me is one of the most fascinating magic texts and, and fairly straightforward, simple requirements to do it. The Hala manuscript has a version from the Summa Sacra Magica text, which has gotten a lot of attention in recent decade. And the version that's in the Hala manuscript is, according to Dr. Gare, who's published the Summa Sacra Magica, the most important of the Almadel texts. And unfortunately, the writing is is very difficult and daunting. So it's taking quite a bit of effort and time to do that. In this case, the Almadel has been removed from the Castle manuscript at some point, apparently after John D. owned the manuscript. So we don't have two versions to compare it with. We do have the, the German translation of the Summa, which contains it as well. But it's a considerably more difficult reading those particular manuscripts. So, But it's a fun project, and that's that's one of the things I'm working on. Joe, I have to ask this because you've seen so many manuscripts in your career with your expertise. As you mentioned, some manuscripts are much more difficult to read uh, than others for various reasons. What would you say is is one of the toughest or most difficult manuscripts to actually read? Really quick, as a civilian, as someone who relies on scholars such as yourself, when I first looked at the Ghent manuscript with the Eleuchidarium, I remember saying... Oh my gosh, compared to VSG 334 and the beautiful writing there, the Ghent manuscript is uh, a little bit challenging, but just from with your professional experience, is there one manuscript that sticks out that you're like, my goodness, this one might be might require a little more time? Well, as I mentioned, the Hala manuscript it has multiple handwriting in it, but it contains some of the most difficult, for me at least, to read. Ghent has its own problems because of physical damage in the text, but I actually think it was easier for me to get used to the writing in the Ghent manuscript than the uh, Hala manuscript. Probably the most difficult ones, I'd have to point to the Heptarchia Mystica manuscripts that John D. wrote, his draft versions of it. I, I recently put on my website, esotericarchives.com another version of the Heptarchia Mystica that I discovered, and that along with the version that's in the additional 36674, I believe, it was extremely difficult to read. So those are some of the the highlights or lowlights, as it may be. Absolutely. Well, and I, and I know that just hearing you describe that, Joe, is one of at least 85 reasons why I know myself and the listeners are so thankful for your expertise and your scholarship. Joe, too, I, I know we do have a brief uh, after show for patrons, but in addition to getting a copy of your book, the second edition of your Grimoire Verum, which listeners, please check out the podcast and video uh, links below. How else can people support your work or are there any other resources or any other information that you'd like to uh, leave listeners with? 
Well, I always appreciate donations, and there is a link on my Esoteric Archives uh, website. I also wanted to mention I appreciate greatly when people spot and point out typos, and especially when they bring my attention to manuscripts or printed editions that I may not have seen or have the, uh, the expertise to, to try to mine. Those are always uh, very important to me. Listeners, keep your eyes peeled and also check out the links below to Joe's donate button as well to support Joe's website and work because it is uh, such a treasure and very generous and an amazing resource that, that Joe offers. Scholar, author, his latest second edition update of his Grimoireum Verum text is available now. Uh, Joseph H. Peterson. Joe, thank you so much for taking some time out of your very busy schedule to chat about this on the podcast today. Thank you very much, Alex. Enjoyed talking with you. Listeners and Glitch Bottle patrons, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Joseph H. Peterson as much as I did. Every single publication, every new update on esotericarchives.com, it's just a reminder for how amazing and rejuvenating Joe's research is, and also the context and connecting the dots, the cross-pollination, all of it just makes me super, super grateful for Joe and his amazing contributions. So a huge thanks to Joe and a huge thanks to each and every Glitch Bottle patron on patreon.com slash glitch bottle. You are the reason why the podcast continues to grow. There's also an after show that you can check out with Joseph H. Peterson for Glitch Bottle patrons talking about the book of three souls, which I think you'll really enjoy as well. As always, this is Alexander F. reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. Keep the light.